Thank you, uh, Sarah. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is William Tu, as you know, introduced by Sarah. I'm from the Industry and Commercial Bank of China, Canada. So we just call us a long name instead of ICBC in China and in other rest of the world. We have the footprint because of this is the trademark of the insurance company of British Columbia. So this is a good example about the intellectual properties. Uh, we Chinese, you know, Chinese companies respect those intellectual properties. But we keep on negotiation with ICBC in Canada, try to find a solution for us, because it's, we are the only country we cannot use ICBC globally. So I'm so happy to be here. It's my first time to, uh, in the oldest city in North America. I've been in Canada for five years, but this is actually the first time, and I spent a half day last yesterday to, to take a city tour. It's really impressive, and I really enjoyed their visit here. So before I start, I would like to... Yes. A little bit about our, our bank. So may, uh, you may not know our bank very well. We are the, now the largest bank in the world uh, by a few uh, terms, uh, a few things like the assets and loans, deposit, first tier capitals. The total assets of the group are roughly 20 trillion RMB, so it's equal to 3.5 trillion Canadian dollar. So we found on July 1st, 1984, we are separate from the People's Bank of China uh, so lots of people may think you know, Bank of China is the central bank of China because in Canada we call it the Bank of Canada, right? But in China we call it the People's Bank of China. So it's a very fancy, you know, uh, things, you know, to add a people before the different names. So you will be very light, you know, like the people's, you know, uh, store, supermarket, everything like that in China. So it's, it's uh, just the name, but, uh, you know, in Canada, I know the government bear, the, bear all everyone's mind about the people. So just the same, China in this, uh, you know, not very different from Canada. Not, uh, in political, it's a communist, you know, party uh, manage the countries, but you know, that's not very different. Every country try to serve their people well. So uh, we are separate from People's Bank of China in 1984. And uh, well, it has matured to be the largest commercial bank in China. As a risk of our constant exertion and the continuous improvement, the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China has not only become the leading force of bank in China, but also the, uh, the number one bank in the world in terms of total assets, first tier capital, loans, and profitability. As we continue to exceed our goals of the steady movement towards globalization and the integration uh, of the business, we are confident in saying that we are the most internationalized bank in, in China. So currently our network covered consists of over uh, 388 you know, overseas institutions in 40 countries and territories. So uh, why we are going abroad? It's very simple. It's not led by the government. It's driven by the business. So like other countries, you know, uh, companies, uh, there are two main reasons. The first day, after, you know, three decades of hard growth, lots of Chinese companies, they accumulate enough, you know, uh, wealth. They want to take part in their global competition and their global market, explore the global market. So uh, though our clients are going abroad, so we are following our, our client pace to go abroad. Otherwise, we will lose them in domestic market, right? And the second reason is, you know, uh, of the concentration risk we, we are facing. We have uh, 20 trillion RMB total assets, but the, among them, you know, even we have the 40 countries coverage right now. We only, the total assets of the uh, other countries only account 7% uh, 7 of the total assets of a group. So lots of assets are still uh, located in China. So this is a very, uh, you know, our bank are pursuing high steed growth instead of fracturation. We're trying to avoid any, you know, uh, uh, lots of fracturation like the other banks, United States banks, European banks, they ever made. So we, we sh 
must utilize the different, you know, economic bodies cycle, economic cycles, to uh, to use the boom and bust to to uh, keep a very steep growth. So in this terms, I think you know I see BK uh, share lots of similarity with their uh, Newfoundland and Labrador because you guys you know are also facing a concentric risk uh, because of the clients. And uh, you needed the diver diversification, and our bank needed diversification uh, as well. Uh, our subsidiary in Canada, very small, and uh, a tiny bank in Canada. We acquired Bank of East Asia, Canada, back to 19, uh, 2010. And uh, now we got the uh, nine branches and uh, one coming branch in Canada. Are, uh, mainly located in GTA, Vancouver, and Calgary. I wish we can, in some day, we can have another one in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. Over the past decades, China, China's economy has experienced considerable growth. However, as a result of its limited diversity of the domestic mineral resources and the reserves, the need for Chinese enterprises to import oro, iron ore and to search for mineral resources overseas boomed. It was the beginning of the foreign investment prospecting and acquisitions. The desire to invest in overseas money and, uh, surged from Chinese enterprise in the year 2000, and even more so after 2005, as the increasing demand for energy and other minerals persists. China surpassed the United States in 2011 in being the world's largest consumer of energy, accounting for more than 20% of the world total consumption. China is aiming to develop at a higher rate while maintaining healthy and stable economic growth. Thus, the China, Chinese demand for energy and other mineral resources will continue to exceed that of other countries. The economic growth and the urbanization of China has increased the domestic demand for foreign energy, mining, agriculture, science, and technology in overseas markets, such as Canada. In addition, the Chinese government is further in promoting foreign trade with its economic reform policies. With the government's support to reduce the barriers for foreign investment, Chinese enterprises are able to expand abroad within, uh, with few difficulties. It is predicted that the total amount of foreign investments made by Chinese enterprise will reach 500 billion in the next five years. We are optimistic in anticipating that Canada, with its large base of the Chinese immigrants, will be a major destination for where the investments will flow. So the annual growth rate of China GDP has been diminishing in the past few years to a low of 7.7 .7 last year. And the first half of this year is even lower, 7.5%. The current trend for the entire mining market is downward sloping. Chinese mining companies are facing many barriers, such as short-term overcapacity, the pressure of environmental remediation and the decreasing products prices globally. Domestic mining investment in China has shown low growth trends with foreign investment also in decline. From a global perspective, the world economic is recovering at a slow pace. The IMF has revealed a decrease in global economic growth from 3.2% to 2.9%. With the World Bank's forecast even lower at 2.2%. Due to the reduced demand, commodity prices have diminished dramatically in the last year, with even further decreasing global mining investment. In Canada, investments made to mining sector have seen cutbacks as well as cross border merger and acquisitions. Canada and China should grasp this opportunity. Because in Chinese we call Wei Ji. Wei is means uh, crisis. Ji means opportunity. So in Chinese, Wei and Ji always get together. So I think, you know, because 
Uh, yeah, we're facing big challenges ahead, but this is also a, po a, a very good opportunity for uh, we collaborate together. And so Canada and China should grasp this opportunity during this period of decline to strengthen their mutual benefit, beneficial cooperation in mining industry and also the energy industry. China will continue to endure a time of steady demand for minerals in the long run, as a strong Sino-Canada partnership will provide a long-term stable supply of minerals to Canada, China and increasing, increased trade in Canada. So Canada is a stable resource of supply for China and can help China find a sustainable solution to resource development and uh, inter then you know, to help Chinese uh, people to live a higher standard. It's just a, a very simple uh, you know, uh, methodology. So for Canada, investment helps fund resource development and the driven up economic growth and the employment. Now, as you know, Mr. Yu Benling, Minister Councillor from the Embassy of China in Canada said, uh, the Chinese investment in Canada is a very small number of Chinese funded enterprises with a lot of money to be invested in energy and mining industry across Canada. In 2013, Chinese investors have invested over 50 billion US dollars in Canadian energy and the mining sector and the more than 200 Chinese enterprises invested in Canada. Among them, roughly 90% uh, of those enterprises are state-owned enterprises, either by, uh, can, owned by the central government or the provincial government. And the rest are private companies. And the Chinese investment uh, invested in many industries, including energy, mainly in Alberta, and the mining industry located in uh, BC, in Ontario, and uh, also Newfoundland and Labrador, and uh, Quebec. And the finance, like you know, our bank, uh, we are here, the Bank of China, they are here, and uh, the Chinese Construction Bank will be coming shortly. And in the future, the Agriculture Bank of China and uh, the Communication Bank of China, they are also pursuing a license in Canada. And uh, even including some private, uh, you know, private sector banks, you know, uh, they are willing to explore this market in the future. And also the manufacturing, like the high-end technology IT companies, the logistic transportation as well. So uh, quite diversified, but very concentrated to the energy and the mining industry and lead by the SOE companies, of course. So lots of discussion about the Chinese SOE, but I, in my point of view, you know, uh, it's a very nature of business because, you know, SOE have the right resources to go broad firstly. They have the capital, they have the human resource, they have the international visions, they have the, the other, you know, uh, uh, supportings. But I don't think you know it's it's uh, anything related to the communist party and the other things like the, the political issues. These, this is just a business, and I think you know uh, following that pace to go abroad in China, in Canada, uh, more and more you know private act, uh, sector companies they will follow in that pace, and the medium company they will go out, and actually you know the, even the SOE companies they are facing the challenge in. Uh, overseas investment. Like our bank, you know, currently their total assets account 7% of the total group assets. And, uh, but, you know, if you calculate separately, it ran ranks um, a hundreds in the world as the largest bank. You know, if we separate our overseas assets, it's already ranked a hundreds. So, and uh, we have 11,000, you know, uh, stuffs, uh, overseas stuffs. Among them, we only, you know, send out 700, you know, uh, domestic stuff. So it's a uh, uh, very challenging for our bank. So every year, our bank will send out, you know, uh, 200 skilled staff 
to be trained in lots of you know uh, uh, well-known you know universities, uh, including the UFT, UBC, those universities. This is a one-year program. They will get the intensive you know English training in China for two or three months. Then they will be uh, sent out to other universities and attend their their courses with the local uh, students for six another six months, and they will get the opportunity to have a, a similar intern or, or uh, some sort of that kind of program to understand their uh, their foreign countries uh, working culture working cultures. So that will be another three months. So it's a ten uh, one year program. It will last ten years to support our banks go abroad. This is a very you know, bold you know, uh, investment for our bank. But our lots of companies in China, they are not able to do that. So they have the lots of you know, uh, limits for them to invest overseas. So quite diversified. In the future, I think you know, it will be even more diversified. Because you know, uh, Chinese private sector, they are just pursuing the, the return of the investment. They are not care about their their, whether it's energy, it's mining, so they are quite diversified needs. So let's look at these pictures. So we got uh, a few, uh, I put a few names under these pictures, these maps, and uh, those are Chinese major investors in the western part of Canada, you know, the logistic companies like Costco, Signal Trains, the airlines, Air China, Eastern China uh, Airline, and uh, the Sichuan Airlines. And we have so got lots of you know, uh, mining industry in, in uh, either the uh, copper or other, uh, other uh, minerals. And uh, in Alberta, we, uh, three big Chinese giants, they out there, and they investment account for 77% of total investment in Canada. And uh, in Ontario is quite diversified. High technologies like Huawei, ZTE, and uh, the uh, recycle, you know, uh, energies like Longyuan, and uh, also in Quebec we got the GN Nickel and and some you know Chinese you know manufacturer investment, and in uh, Newfoundland we get you know, Hebei Iron and Steel uh, investment. They are working with Alderlong and, and uh, their project and uh, the Hunan non ferrous mantles. That's uh, another uh, story. And uh, maybe the Wuhan uh, iron and steel, they are working with the new century, and they are investing in the same areas. Oops. So there there are uh, a few challenges uh, Chinese investment they are facing in Canada, uh, mainly in three, uh, four areas. The first one is technology. So, so there, especially in mining industry, discovering reliable mineral resources is a difficult task. In most cases, the actuary and the predicted number of mineral reserves are inconsistent. According to the statistics from Global Network, their successful rate of the preliminary investment project is approximately 5%. Thus, therefore, investors are facing risk by investing solely based on the estimated numbers. And the communication between the two countries is also a concern. Due to the culture and the language difference, it's difficult for enterprise from two countries to communicate fluently and accurately, or to deliver their ideas and thoughts thoroughly. Therefore, there are all dissimilarities in technology terms used, which may lead to misinterpretation of the data and the reports. This may be critical in some situations, as data and the reports are the only resource of information Chinese investors can rely on before making the investment decisions. The second concern that most Chinese investors they uh, have is human resource. I already mentioned. Canada is a large country consisting of a very small population relatively with a lack of technology, uh, technical personnel for the mining industry. 
Furthermore, their uh, rigorous policies on employment of foreign laborers make their hiring uh, technical personnel from outside of country an arduous task. There are also exists the issues concerning the First Nation, unions, local communities, and the NGOs which need to be properly resolved and addressed too. So those are, are, are new issues they were not facing in China. It's a, it's a very strange uh, thing for them, so it's a, it's a big challenge for them. And uh, the third one is infrastructure. Canada's lack of infrastructure is causing many investors to have second thoughts before investing. Canada is rich in resources but sparely populated and many are located in remote areas where infrastructure is insufficient. Existing infrastructure in some areas may not meet the normal requirements of business operations, resulting in producing a product backlog, storage facility facing tremendous pressure, leading to serious issues such as production being forced to slow down. The poor infrastructure in remote area, in rural area, and the high cost of transportation will cause the operation cost to be higher than expected, thus make, making the investment less profitability. So like in China, you know, 8% of their, their uh, percentage of the RNO, their mining, uh, they will be very profitable project. But in Canada, maybe 20%, uh, it's not still, you know, they are losing money. So it's a big challenge. It's, uh, I am so happy to learn about lots of, you know, new uh, infrastructure projects has been launched in Newfoundland and Labrador area, uh, uh, province, and uh, the, the, uh, the muskrat you know, uh, project and other uh, power supply projects is very, it's keen to Chinese investors. I learned from one of the Chinese you know, big mining company. They already uh, put in to produce of the mine in northern Quebec, but you know, they are surprised they are powered by, you know, uh, just by the fuels they purchased. So it's a very, very uh, uh, expensive way to support that operation. So that's a, a good, okay. And the, the last one was finance. The difficulty for investors to obtain, you know, fund from local banks. Because those, you know, Greenland, you know, projects, they start from scratch. So no local banks will fund their projects. So and uh, very only limited amount allowed to be transferred out of from China. And uh, uh, limited access to capital market in North America as well. So those are big challenges for Chinese uh, investors they are facing in Canada. So some recommendation for, uh, for government and uh, their uh, potential you know, uh, partners of Chinese companies. I think you, know, you should prepare another uh, short-term slowdown for future investment. That's uh, definitely true. You know. uh, maybe Chinese, uh, I, I don't think Chinese economy will have a hard landing, but I, I think you know, we're facing lots of challenges because after three decades high growth, there are accumulated lots of problems needed to be solved. And this is uh, the, 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 the uh, short term, you know, slow down. And, but, you know, we should be optimistic about the round run, you know, uh, opportunities in China. Urbanization, lots of things will create lots of, you know, needs. And China is not able to supply their own needs by themselves. And the, the third one is preparing yourself to do business with Chinese companies. I think, you know, Sarah already mentioned a few good points for, for you guys here and to understand them. They have culture shocks, they have difference. Please bear in mind and try to communicate and understand with them. The fourth one is building a long-term relationship with Chinese partners. Uh, those are, we are talking to the Chinese investors in the same way. Uh, you should have figured out the right partners in Canada instead of, you know, solely control the company, invest by yourself. You should build up a relationship. But the most important thing is to figure out the right partners in, in Canada or in China. 
And the, the, the last one is we should help them to be success in Canada. Otherwise, no successful story, there will no uh, investment further. And uh, because, you know, as I know, every Chinese big, you know, mining company, they are investing in Canada already. Either they already have the projects or they already have the rep offices here. But, you know, uh, none of them, they are very success in, in, in this area if they uh, invest by themselves. But, you know, Wuhan, they make money. Then their, their story is good because they are working with the Cliff and on the other projects. So uh, what we can do, you know, I think, you know, uh, as the number one commercial bank in China, we are, we are proud to say we, 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 we are very interested to fund lots of projects here. Actually, we are already doing lots of projects in Canada because, you know, uh, uh, Chinese investors, they hard to get the fund locally. So we transfer their creditworthiness in China to Canada. And through our subsidiary in, their, uh, in, in Canada, we provide funds to them. And uh, because of we have more than uh, 17,000 branches in China and more than 400,000 you know, uh, staffs in China, we have uh, 470 million individual clients and 4 million corporate clients in China. And we have one of the strongest you know, IT platforms in the world. So we are very uh, proud to say you know, we can help you to either figure out uh, your Chinese you know, investors or your, to explore a Chinese market. But you know, because our strategy in Canada is we not only to compete with local banks. Instead of build up a long-term strategy with the local big banks, fully utilize our capacity in China to promote, to in create an even bigger market in between China and Canada. So we uh, encourage you to uh, you know, talk to with your local banks and let them to uh, reach us. Then we will build a, a very solid you know, foundation for your investment uh, to China or to solicit investment from China. So uh, that said, I think you know, uh, those are projects, uh, products we are offering. I don't want to <coughs> touch everyone. Everything's here. So in conclusion, Chinese ongoing economy reform policy unleash the China country's potential for development. It's, it's estimated that by 2020, urbanization will, cost, uh, will lead you know, 90 million Chinese rural re residents to move to urban areas. This movement will create a larger demand for energy and mineral, minerals, with the government of China adopting more facilitating and flexible, flexible policies, encouraging of outbound investment. Cooperation between China and Canada will be more common in the future. Like I have mentioned before, the, uh, our bank is currently the biggest bank in China. No, I, I don't need to read it again. <laughs> so market is recovering and the Chinese investors are eager to get back into the game. It's predicted that the foreign investment by uh, Chinese enterprise will be even bigger. So it's our job to verify the the Chinese are taking the investment here to Canada. Uh, in the 1980s, the first generation of Chinese immigration had made a significant contribution to connect Eastern and Western Canada by building the Canadian Pacific Railway. Today, following the tremendous development in both nations, the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China would like to act as the trial blazer to build up the relationship and the collaboration of Canada and China with our hard working and uh, dedication. We would like to act as a bridge that connects the Canadian companies to the rest of the world, providing the services to, that you deserve. Thank you very much.